Guess what today is? First day of National Poetry Month. I'm so happy. National Poetry Month, which was dedicated 15 years ago. So this is the 15th anniversary. All right. So tonight, we have a really special event tonight. Um, I decided that we were going to honor the poets that have been here in this town for a while. So tonight, starting off, we're going to have Claire, Claire Pearson. I matched her up with Mary Habern, right? Um, and Mary is the co-founder of the Poets' Corner here. So Claire is going to uh, is going to read one of Mary's poems, and then she's going to read a response to that particular poem. And this is what all the poets are going to do tonight. So without further ado, please give a big round of applause to Claire Pearson. Okay, I'm covering Mary, and I've picked who will pick the morning rose. So let's get this started. Which one of us will bolt awake and reach in vain across the bed, then rail against the mounting ache? Which one will face the daily dread of going on alone? Who'll make the bed once made by two and close the house against the rain? Which one will close, choose the morning brew and grind the beans and feel the pain of making half a pot? Who'll face the morning news alone at angels to an empty chair? Who'll lift the ringing phone for family news? an ache to share. Who'll pick the morning rose? Okay, that's Mary's piece, and here's my response. Uh. I wanted to be the one that would bolt awake, dripping with night's terrace-tainted sweat, hoping you'll somehow be there after you left me for a few dozen layers of paradise. But apparently the universe had other plans. You're the w and you are the one that has to face the day alone. But now I am that summer thunderstorm that makes you swoon. I fill that room with tantalizing espresso caresses, even though there's only half a pot. I try to be on the other line when you listen to stories over the electronic messenger bird from my mother, the stories about my sisters. I still love everything about you, and I tried to make that morning rose absolutely breathtaking for you. Please give a big round of applause for Miss Mackenzie Taylor. I'm Mackenzie Taylor, and I was assigned Adele Cerrone as a poet. So today I'll be reading Dancing Aspen by Adele Cerrone. This fall, my daughter, I almost see you walk in gold and saffron mirage between the leaves your shadow answered on white bark dappled with fire. You who have opened up to us the sky, this forest, the shimmering yellow sea of light so transient that while we breathe, it breaks. You have taught us this epiphany that we may know our own deep branching roots. Thank you. Okay. This is my response poem. This spring, my mother, I almost see you dance in lavender scented winds, twirling youthful green, buds blending cream to sunburst yellow, a lemon chiffon gown rising from soft earth, the color of coffee grounds, the smell of cool rain. Speckled light plays on your dewy lids, your intoxicating aroma like a floral dream dust, sparkling in warm beams of light. You who brought us this flowering field, these clear blue heavens and this lush green grass, suspended forever in a changing infinity of new life. You have taught us this epiphany to always lift our blooming hearts to the sun. I hope we may listen. Give a big round of applause for Mr. Brandon Roberts. My poem is by James Bishop, and his poem is The Great Houdini. Stars will burn through the sheets of the clouds, and a new voice is heard. Life is a river. Time is a river. Love is a river. Will that voice be our own? 
We must love our brothers, urged Chief Seattle. We f they feed our children and quench our thirst. Two atoms hydrogen, one of oxygen, but control of our addiction has yet to be shown. Dad old man river, Oshinuando, the moonlight's fair tonight upon the Wabash. Remember the days when rivers came first? What would the world be, pondered the poet Hopkins, once bereft of wet and wild. If poems and lyrics were water, our reservoirs would be fairly spilling over. We'd be somewhere else tonight, I'd bet. Now Mr. Drought shadows us, a monster spreading fear. In our, res in our reveres and nightmares, we wonder what its plans are for this year. Civilizations, cities, and tribes rise and fall to the great Houdini's tune. Are we the new Sinagua, the Hohokam, seeking visions of sacred lands gone to dune? Know this for real. The great Houdini's magic is always changing, sometimes solid, sometimes liquid, sometimes gas. Better bring the dowser soon, or we won't need our drinking glasses. Ignore the bulldozing boomers. There's water everywhere and ever so much to drink. Fie on their words. That is only what they want us to think. What do we know about what we don't, what we don't know? When will the waters cease their rolling from the mountain springs? What about the philosophizing buzzards? Do they know the secrets of the disappearing snow? And what about the lions, skunks, eagles, horses, and other four-legged living things? Despite denials and political apathy, the handwriting is on the wall. Like Humpty Dumpty, we could be headed for a great fall. Whiskey is for drinking, water is for fighting, the old timers say. When will we get it that old sayings are as useless as a pole's promise? The tree rings tell the story. The lions know it too. The wise Apaches say, in flood or scarcity, water creates diversity on earth. Unlike the valley dwellers who came before us, are we prepared for the water's dearth? The stars will burn through the sheets of the clouds, and a new voice must be bor born, that of our own. The frog never drinks up the pond in which it lives. Better we listen to the Hopi and become adherent progressives. All the old stories begin and end with the waters. Let, let's leave a legacy for our sons and our daughters. And this is my response, approaching the Delta. When the duties of one generation fall upon the shoulders of another, and the pressures brought on by all the opposing views of mother and the father, the fledgling on their deathbeds and the lively newly born, the east and the west and all that lie in between in this solar incubator, we learn from those who have thrived and those who have been deprived, and what should we become? Life is a river. Should we assume that that river down which we float is an endless one? In this canyon between the dauntingly tall faces to the left of us and the right of us, it becomes apparent, apparent that we must not jump from one, one side or the other. This magician has breathed life into our spines and we cannot escape its grasp. We all cling to its endless flow for without it we would perish. This magician that wields our fate does so not by grace, but by nature and truth. Every bend in the current rocks society to its knees. This magician rules our lives without our slightest inclination. But the Bedouin, the nomads of the Gobi Steppe and the dwellers of the Nazca Basin, they all know the power and importance of the magician's tricks. I am at the cusp of everything that lies in the future. Should I step hurriedly in to fill the slot conveniently placed by my parents? Or should I forge my own place on this crumb? We have been left a gift. It is old, it is changing, it is unpredictable, and it is full of potential. Time is a river, and I, knew not, I do not blind my eyes to the ocean ahead. It is approaching, and what should my people do to prepare? The Morai, Samoan, and Polynesian have faced this before. Water, water, everywhere, nor a drop to drink. As the mouth of the river widens and the delta stretches out to sea, we find amidst the scattered ashes of our once so, de so decadent lives a knowledge that we have been here before. And so we must set sail into the horizon, not to be rebuild what was once ours, but to build anew what will belong to posterity. 
taking from all the wisdom of antiquity, we enact a mutual respect, a reverence, and a reliance upon the great Houdini. Love is a river. Love is a river and it flows with the intensity of every war ever waged and every vow ever made. Every man, woman, and child drinks from this stream and springs forth new tributaries into it. Love is a river and it can sweep you off your feet. It can cause fruitful valleys to form, filling the water's edge with forests and aromatic orchards. Love is a river and it can devastate, flooding over the, and breaching our walls, turning monuments to rubble and decimating the foundations on which we reside. Love is a river and it can kill you, but we need it to survive. Moderation and generosity move as one. Let us take from these streams what we need and allow, allow the rest to flow downriver. Thank you. Uh, so please, without further ado, uh, give it up for Joey Carollo. So here's Planet Broccoli by Gary Every. The highest paying job of, on the planet of the broccoli people is the job of hairdresser. An intergalactic being skilled with scissors, blades, who can whirl, shape, moose, and sculpt will find his bank account filled with plenty of bushel and peck, the official monetary units of Planet Broccoli. Every civilization has their master craftsmen, the potters of the Anasazi, the sculptors of ancient Rome, the goldsmiths of the Inca, and Planet Broccoli has their hairstylists. Those gifted in the topiary arts are revered as rock stars, as fashions rage and styles change. These broccoli barbers cut, swir cut and curl mohawks, dreadlocks, Farrah Fawcett swirls, and bright green Dorothy Hamill wedges from hell. Sometimes technology creates unexpected changes, such as the innovations in genetic design. And now the emperor's new clothes are worn by genetically engineered pollinators. Beautiful young broccoli girls bursting with the flowering of maidenhood. Yellow spring blossoms adorning, adorning their florets are surrounded by genetically engineered pollinators, such as polka dot bumblebees or glow in the dark hummingbirds. The gothic broccoli girls cover their skin with, white, thick, with thick white makeup, dye their bright green florets black, and surround themselves with bats. The flying mammals hover and flap, long slender tongues stretching and stretching, fuzzy noses covered in golden sticky pollen while the broccoli girls blossom and bloom. And here's my response poem. It'll be, the title will become apparent pretty soon. In all of the universe, few can best the broccoli people at hairstyling. However, there is one culture whose skills of hairstyling rival even those of the broccoli people. The carrot people of the carrot planet value hairstyling almost as much as the broccoli people, only they are not as creative, artistic, or funny. As the, bro uh, as the broccolians, instead, they value other things. Where the broccoli artisans see swirls, swoops, and style, the karate masters, as they are sometimes known, only see angles, planes, and boxes. They believe in uniformity, the ability for a hairsmith to get a haircut to within a hundredth, hundredth of an inch of everyone else's. That is an ability far more valued than any form of artful chaos or planned insanity. They use special tools that are combinations of geometric instruments and the usual barbershop hardware. Compass clippers, protractor scissors, and straight-edged combs are the usual culprits, although some eccentrics use razor levels. The carrot people's stylists, or carrot toppers, are much loved by their people, but they often argue with their broccoli neighbors, broccoli neighbors at their biannual bi-planet conventions. Are they artists or scientists? Are they the architects or merely contractors? The broccoli people ask these questions, but the carrot people never pay much attention, for they are content doing as the people want. The day the crowd of orange and green begs for flair, they will learn to specialize in the pompadour and perm. But for now, they are settled in their niche. They don't sell structure for the head, but pleasure for the heart. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for coming out tonight. And thank you to all the poets that have been here. Uh, yes, absolutely.